Well, I was born in East Point, St. Philip, which is right on the eastern tip of Barbados, um, and really grew up there until I was about age 13, going on 14. Um, St. Philip is a very rural area, but it's right on the coast where I was um, in East Point, so I spent lots of young, my young days running around in plenty of open spaces. Say as a result of your parents going away, you were forced to grow up, grow up. What, what caused that and what do you think, because some people might not grow up, some people might just, do you really think that's a result of your parents going away? Because some people might just lay back because their parents are not around, which does happen in some sense. Well, I think my, my case was slightly different in that um, my mother went away in 1955 when I was two years old. Um, so I was literally brought up by my grandmother and aunt and other aunts and other cousins. So really, my grandmother didn't just look after myself and my sister. I mean, within the household you had... I had an aunt um, who was in Canada. She had a boy there. My aunt who lived there, she had two daughters still living there. Obviously myself and Margaret. And another aunt who was in England, she had two children there as well. Okay. So there were you know, six, seven of us that were brought up at the same time. Um, so really, the only unfortunate thing was that it was a uh, when I say unfortunate, I don't mean that in a bad sense, in that it was a household of all women. <laughs> so um, there, were no, there were no adult males once my uncles had gone, ab had gone abroad. So basically, we were brought up by women. Um, so there were three boys, myself, Andrew and Edward, um, who were all grands. But we were boys, so it was like, so a lot of influence really was female because they were the, the dominant partner in the house. Okay. Um, saying that, if you don't ask this, just say so, but in many aspects of Caribbean society, some things are very matrifocal in terms of the household. Do you feel that it has? I don't really want to ask you because it feels like I'm asking a question that I shouldn't be asking. But do you feel like it's had a negative impact on society, or do you do? You, is it a thing where? Yeah, that's my question. No, I, well, I mean, I, I can speak for my for my case. Um, I mean, for me, it didn't have a negative um, impact on on certainly in my case because I mean, my 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 grandmother was a very dominant. Um, lady small in stature very small but you know, fierce fierce and um, really to us to her you know we were her children and she did everything that was needed possibly to make sure that you know we got what we needed and we were looked after so from that point of view there was no fallout from my part in relation to having a male um, as a, as a dominant partner in the house. I mean, I think she made up for a male. Um, I don't think a male could have been any stronger than she was, a extremely strong lady. Okay, all right. So um, you kind of talked about it's, um, East Point being a rural area. Um, so it was very enjoyable, I guess, growing up in that, because you had space or maybe... Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, I mean, I still go back there now when I, when I need to recharge my batteries, I mean, up to Saturday night, I was back there where all the boys that I went to school with, every Saturday they meet at a certain point, even though I'm not there every Saturday because I'm involved with sport and such. But when I get the opportunity, I go back. On Saturday I went back and we just meet up and chat and whatever. So it was that sort of a place. I mean, it's, as I said, it's very rural. So, you know, you're a long way away from town. In those days, it would have been in enormous distance because obviously transportation wouldn't be so readily available. But it was a fantastic place in terms of open spaces, you know, and the houses were not close together, um, right by the beach, um, you know. So it was a fantastic time and I loved my childhood and I really would not have wanted to be anywhere else because, you know, it was, you know, you were safe, it was open, and it was a real community 
feeling. People really looked after each other. You knew everybody in the community. They knew you, they knew your grandmother. Um, you could not walk the street and misbehave because somebody knew your grandmother and would speak with your grandmother. So for me, it was a fantastic time. Okay, okay. All right, so um, what, how did you get involved in cricket? That's my really good question um, I to ask you. That's a very interesting question because I, 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 I've i tried to ask myself the same question and why was I so drawn to this game and when did it start? And the, the honest truth is I really don't know. Um, what I do know is that I, for some reason, had this, you know, this great love for this game. Um, being one of the, I guess one of the younger boys, in those days, you know, the, the people who played informal cricket um, to any standard were generally the bigger boys in the district. Um, I was a small, I was one of the small boys, but I just had this interest and I would always be around them watching, you know, sitting down watching, watching, watching. And I guess after a period of time, the older boys must have decided, listen, this youngster, like he's really interested in this in this game. Let's um, let's get him involved. So, you know, initially they let you field. You know, just come and be a fielder. Um, that's how it started. And then, as times develop, you know, if if they're shorter players, you know, they give you, you know, your bat last and whatever. But for me, even while that was going on, I kept going back. I kept going back all the time. So. Um, then they became very interested and um, you know the love just increased I, I really don't know how it started but then I would obviously play as often as I can with my peers you know you play in formal cricket with all sorts of of things so you know it, it, it's, it's a question that I've asked myself I'm looking at your face but I think looking at your face I'm making an assumption it brings back a lot of positive memories us like well it does it does because it, 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 it you know it is how it started you know it is it is not that I was packed off to a camp to be taught by a coach um, you know as part of some grand plan it didn't it wasn't like that it was 21st just century. yeah it, was, it wasn't a 21st century development it was just something in the game just sparked my passion um, and then, obviously, once I was into the game at primary school, um, at St. Catherine's Primary School, then we would get, um, a coach would come, I think sometimes, once a month or whatever. And those coaches were Seymour Nurse and uh, Charlie Griffith, who were established West Indies players. Um, so they would come once a month as part of the National Sports Council coaching program. Um, so that's something you look forward to. And then I guess to back up what they did. Um, coming from that area that I came from in those days, um, technology was not, technology was very scarce in those, in those regions. And when I say a, a thing like a television was a, was a gold dust. I mean, the area that I lived in, which if I take from Merrick's to Marley Vale, it will take you 10, 15 minutes to walk. So it's quite a big area. Within that region, there was one television. You know, there was one family that had a television. Um, so, you know, basically, all the boys and girls in the district would congregate at this house, this people's house, and sit and watch television. Um, so, if anything, cricket ways was on there. Obviously, you saw it. But the government used to also once, once every few months, send around something called a mobile cinema, and it would come to the school, a big van with a big screen, and the whole district would sit on the ground on the pasture at the school at my local school. But part of that mobile cinema's night was, you know, the usual, you know, Bud and Lou, uh, and but there was also there was also a cricket 
it was show cricket, a test match. Okay. A famous, a cricket that involved the West Indies team, always. So, you know, that, I guess that sparked the desire to want to be an international cricketer by watching Rohan Kanai and so you my cousin made, Basil Butcher and others on the screen. You kind of made that decision from early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, from, I mean, I, I didn't know how. I mean, I, I, from a young, very young kid, I, I just, there's two things I wanted to achieve. Um, I either wanted to be a pilot or a cricketer, but cricketer first. But how that was going to be possible didn't even cross my mind because, you know, the region that I was from didn't have a history of producing um, international cricketers. So it was just a dream. So I would ask you, Oh, so did you have much contact with your cousin Basil Bush? Because he was from. Well, no, no, I, I, I didn't because he he was born in Ghana. His his father, obviously, is from our, our region up there. His um, my grandmother is his father's aunt, so his father had moved to Ghana, um, uh, married, and. Obviously, stayed in Ghana, had Basil and the others, and that side of the family developed from Ghana. Um, my grandmother actually did go to Ghana. She went there with um, to work with. The, she, she was working with a doctor who left who left here to go to Ghana. So he took her with with him to Ghana. But I don't think she really liked Ghana that much. So when he was then having another post and he was moving to the States. Um, she decided that she wasn't going to go, she would come back. So she came back to Barbados, so hence everything else stayed this side. But um, could have been Ghanese. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is interesting because I know between the late 1840s and early 1920s there was a lot of migration from yeah. Barbados to Ghana and what made me laugh is that like nearly in the early 2000s there was a lot of Guyanese migration to, to well, Barbados. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> they, they, were, they were a little bit more accommodating than we were. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, so who was your biggest support? Cause, or was it just an intrinsic desire? Um, I would say it with an as intrinsic desire, um, and and I guess your peers really. I mean, the bigger boys, I guess, in the district, um, who's you know who you know saw. Hang on, you know this youngster wants to be involved, so then we'll give him as much opportunity as possible. Um, my household, as I said, was female, so really, in those days. Females were their main thing was about education. <laughs> sport was um, <laughs> sport didn't come into the, the equation at all, you know. So, um, you know, my grandmother, as I said, she was a no nonsense woman. She 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 didn't mind you doing sport or anything else, but you know, first of all, your chores had to come first. So. If it was getting water from the standpipe, if it was feeding the, the sheep and cows and bringing them in, and once you've done all that, um, you know you can go off and, and play your sport. But in the early days, obviously, I, I, I was so keen on the sport that sometimes <laughs> took back to those things were left behind, and obviously she would not be very pleased because her main thing was. Um, I guess to teach you that animals can't look after themselves. Mm. You know, you, you must have the discipline to, and once you're given the job to do, <coughs> that must come first. So sport was never, I wouldn't say that they tried to, to stop me from playing, but they wouldn't understand what the sport meant um, to me. Because to them, like the typical Barbadian at that time, sport was sport, uh, uh, and nothing more. Um, so you get to the age of 13, 14, yeah. and you kind of get that letter or call 
I don't know which one it was, whether it was a letter or call, but you know that you're going to England. Um, yeah. Um, how do you feel about that, having to migrate to Stephen and Sean? Well, basically, um, I guess for years, for years my father had been trying to, to get us to England, of which my grandmother kept refusing. <laughs> Um, obviously she wanted us to be there um, but I think eventually um, around 13 going on 14 you know she decided that really we, you know we needed to have a man figure around so I guess my, my father then got his wish of, of having his, his two other children in England yeah, you asked me a question in terms of how I felt. Um, actually, I didn't mind going because what 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 had really been happening during that period is some of my close friends and relatives, their parents had been sending for them, so I had lost some close friends who'd gone away, and that and I mean and that 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 was very sad because. You know, you, your friends are gone, some of your close family is gone. So that, so obviously when it was my chance to go, I, I really didn't mind because I, you know, if I was the first, then I may not have been too keen. But, you know, friends and other family had gone. That makes sense. I yeah. understand that. Um, okay, so, yeah, I just this just came to mind when I was joining, because these are really notes. Mm -hmm. um, Stevenage. Yeah. So I know that um, what's this? Chris Jordan's mum is from Stevenage, and I know that the Young family that are involved with the Guardian newspaper, the BBC, and so forth are from Stevenage as well. Yeah. And considering it's a small world, did you actually know them? Um. Well, Pat, I did. I mean, he was a friend of mine. Oh. Um, you know, and yeah, we used to move around together once I got into the system. Um. You know, moving to Stevenage was, I mean, it, it was strange because obviously I'd only heard of Stevenage by virtue of where my parents lived, but, you know, knew nothing about it in terms of where it was in England, how it fit into the the system in England, and, and it was very much a, what I got to find out later on is something that they call a new tongue. <laughs> You know that they had developed somewhere out in the, in Hertfordshire. So uh, it was. I'll be honest. I mean, when I when I first went, I I, I didn't like I, I didn't like it. I can tell you that now because you know I'd come from a a background of sun and freedom and uh, you know, and then you're in England where it's cold and a lot of time is spent in the house and and. There's no familiar faces, and so it was. It was tough for I me. Mean, I, I, I really didn't like it. Yeah, I could understand that. Mm -hmm. um, so after your arrival, um, you actually arrived in England, and you said, which was a common experience for mm -hmm. many people that you would never. I think it's to do with the times, the technology problem. Mm -hmm. But you'd never seen your what your mother looked like before. Well, no, I mean, what you remember as a two-year-old. I don't know. My my mother left here. <laughs> Um, you know, when I was two years old. Um, so, what do you remember of of a mother? Um, I, from my mother's side, I mean, I, I obviously I knew all of my other aunts and uncles here from my mother's side because you know they spent a lot of time with me, you know, looking after me. Um, but obviously, my mo seeing my mother again was. Um, Obviously, you would have four, I, mean, I was 13, 14, so you would have photographs and everything, but um, in the flesh, obviously, you know, that, 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 was, that was different. Yeah, that was different. Okay, so you're now in Britain, uh, you're, you, <laughs> you have the situation which my father had, what, in reverse, because he was the English child. Yeah. And um, you and Margaret are having to adjust to the new surroundings. How, how did you deal with that dynamic where you've got these siblings that you haven't really met and then you've got you and Margaret have kind of like come together from Barbados kind of like looking out for each other I guess. 
Yeah, yeah, it was strange, I guess. You know, I guess we were closer together because of, you know, we were here together for that period of time. Um, yeah, it felt strange because you've just moved into a, what seemed a new family, really, because, um, and you were the invited guest. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was, it was different. I mean, as far as my mother was concerned, I mean, it, it, it really didn't mean a great deal because, you know, it's just two more of our kids there. But, but to the to me, it certainly felt, um, it felt strange. It felt different, uh, and and obviously, then they really had different interests to me. Really, um, I think my sister probably adapted more easily. Um, than I did because I guess one she's a she's a girl and and um, here she didn't really do the things that I did so it was quite easy for her to you know to get into the system but for me everything was everything was strange everything was a contradiction of what I did in Barbados. Mm. Okay, so um, ah school system. My ask is as a teacher. This was just general curiosity. Mm. Do you still find um, that? as you have English grandchildren, um, that the children of the Caribbean are still ahead academically because I find that when they, when the children of the Caribbean do come over to England, they always, if they have a supportive family, they they're were, always they were like two, two, <laughs> three steps ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it comes down to the, the emphasis on education <coughs> in Barbados and the emphasis in, in England uh, you know, in, in West Indian families are different. Um, if you go back to what I said when I was a kid, you know, all people think in Barbados is education. I don't think that's always a good thing um, because, you know, you have to change with the times. Um, but from the year dot, education, education. I mean, no parents will still be trying to push their kids to become a doctor, lawyer. Um, and a sports person will own a sports person can earn ten times in one year what they can earn in a lifetime. But our parents were still pushing them towards because they don't recognise anything else. So that is a that's a cultural thing, I guess maybe um, from from the slave days when you when you know once you got out of slavery, you know you try to educate your kids and. Um, but it's, yeah, so it's good and it's bad. Um, I mean, it was noticeable, obviously, when I went to England. Um, I remember I couldn't go to the secondary school where my my two sisters and two brothers in England who, who were born there <coughs> because they had they had their I think they had the quota in terms of numbers for the school. Um, my sister was able to get into that school. Margaret, but I had to go to a different school. Now, my, I remember my experience, my first experience at that school is now, at the time you really didn't understand how the thinking and the system went in England. So, I remember the school gave me, they gave me this test to do. This was secondary school. test I was like five minutes I sort of finish you know and, and the attitude was uh, you, you can't finish but that was stuff I did in primary school <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you understand so straight away their thinking was uh, you know you know this little black boy from you know, so they expected this to be a you know, a challenge. The fact that I was finished in five minutes was like, nah, this can't happen. So then I got to really see that, you know, those schools were not about, they weren't about really pushing you to be the best you can. It was like, it was doing time, get through the day, it's three o'clock, you go home, come back tomorrow, uh, we work through to three again, you go home, it's now Friday night, See you on Monday. Um, so it was very much like that. 
and also I guess from from a from a family point of view, I I I obviously discovered later on that West Indian families also in England don't push the children that way. Um, they're rightly or wrongly they they trust the school to to do the to do the right thing, um, which is which is. It's ludicrous. You, 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 the school. You know, you, you have to be trying to push your children in whatever direction you want them to go into, or they would like to go into. But that was a noticeable difference for me to hear, because you know I came out of a. You know, your grandmother was about school, <laughs> work, school, um, and then. In the school, the teachers are pushing to get the best out of you here. To there, where it was like, well, you're at school, so, you know. It's done for the, you. Yeah. yeah. Which is, yeah, incredibly. Yeah. Incredible. But in terms of, but Pat, yes, Pat was a friend of mine. He was, um, you know, we used to lime together. Um, um, so he's, I've obviously seen him for many years. So uh, what is he doing right now? I think he's, he might have just left the BBC or he's currently still working for the BBC. I'm not too sure. Oh, okay. Um, lots of people from there have achieved high levels of, of things. I mean, you have... I mean, one of the group, one of the friends, one of our friends in that group was um, the, a girl called Sherma Batson. She was. She used to. One of her friends. Oh, she She's deceased now, isn't she? No, she was my. I mean, from a young. We were friends from. Yeah. From the time I went to England, and now she, she, she rose to be. Trinidad or Grenada. Trinidad, yeah, yeah. yeah. And she. She rose to be. Really, she was. Um, local MP. She was local MP, and yeah. she was a mayor. Yeah. She was the mayor of Trinidad. She was the mayor of, of um, Stevenage, etc., etc. So she was part of that group. Um, so when I got the news a year or so ago from the council that she had, it was because I'd only seen her a few months before that. Um, um, I really, so she was part of the group. Uh, that was very unfortunate. But obviously, Pat knows her well too because we used to run around together. Um, but as I said, it's a strange place because Stevenage, if you think of, you know, Lewis Hamilton's come out of there, um, Ashley Young, Jack Wilshire, Jack Wilshire um, Kevin Phillips, who played for England, even before, even before when I was a kid there in England, um, Johnny Brooks, who was a England, England international, um, and in lots of others. That's crazy. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is crazy the amount of people that have actually come out of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like you said. Stevenage? It's, like, it's, it's, it's a new town. Yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's a new. And, and the, the, the facilities, you know, particularly during that time, are not good. Okay. Not good in the area. But somehow they seem to be able to produce these, you know, these, 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 um, these people. So it's still a strange, it's still a strange place. <laughs> okay, so um, you played cricket and you played football, both sports, or maybe you played basketball. You maybe played a whole range of sports. Um, what? How did you get into the cricket game in England, and why not football? Because football would have been culturally maybe played a lot more throughout the year, as opposed not like I know cricket is not played yeah. in England, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically, I mean, the, the the funny thing is when I got, well, in England, in Stevenage, I, obviously you get to meet some friends and whatever, but but then really it was all about football. That's all I did. I just, I didn't play any cricket at all for the, for about a year or so. I just, it was just football. So you met a new group of people who played football all the time. So I got into that uh, and that became very much part of my life, playing football. Um, Getting into cricket was, I guess, luck really, because 
Sunday Sunday was fairly standard for us. A group of friends, we used to go down to the local park and play football all morning. Um, around lunchtime, we'd pack up and you'd come home to have your lunch and then watch the, the football on the TV in the afternoon. That was the that was the norm for every week, every Sunday. Um, so there's one Sunday where we would be done that. Uh, so we were just packing up things to go and some people came onto the field and started to set up some stumps for a cricket match. And they came over to our group and, and said, listen guys, we're a few people short. Um, would any of you guys like to play? So obviously the immediate answer was no because this is about one o'clock. I mean, we've been there since about nine o'clock. Yeah, I was going home. But, but one of my friends said to me, um, Graham Hopkins, he said, that, so you like cricket, why don't you play? Because obviously we had been talking about, you know, obviously before, obviously he was questioning me from coming from the Caribbean and stuff. So he knew he liked cricket. I said, nah, no. But anyway, he persuaded me to play. So I, I sort of went, ran home, got a shirt, came back, played. Didn't do anything great, just I took a couple of catches and a couple of runs. You know, and then they said, look, um, after the game, you know, we got another game next week. I mean, would you like to play? This was for Stevenage 3rd eleven. Um, mm. So eventually I, I said yes, and I came back and played. And, and then very quickly I was in the very quickly I was in the second eleven, um, and then um, obviously did pretty well there. And I was picked in the first eleven when I was fifteen or something. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and that's where it started, really. Okay. Yeah. So um, did you play for a few years, and then the contact came through Middlesex or what? Um, no, it, no, it, it came through. Christina, I mean, um, the time at the time the captain of the first team was a, a guy by the name of Peter Allen, who later became president of the club. But Peter was the captain of the first team at Stevenage, and um, obviously he he saw me play in the reserves, etc., and wanted to elevate me into the first team, and obviously. I mean, Peter has said this recently, you know, he, Peter was called before the board to explain <laughs> why he was playing, you know, this youngster at 15 in the first game. Um, but also I remember in the first team there was a, there was one West Indian guy called Cam Cameron Grant, um, Barbarian. Uh, so, so he sort of like took me under his wing and, and a couple of the other people, so... I said I played as you know when I was about fifteen, and really it um, it came about because within the club and the team there was a, there was a guy by the name of Cyril Hammond, and um, Cyril Hammond was moving. He was leaving Stevenage to go. He was also into football as well. He used to be chairman of uh, Biggleswood Football Club, so he was a real sportsman. But he was leaving Stevenage to go to Gloucestershire to work for Gloucestershire County Cricket Club. Um, so when he went to Gloucestershire, he recommended me to the club because obviously what he had seen, he, he he obviously thought well. So he recommended me to Gloucestershire County Cricket Club. Uh, so on the strength of his recommendation. Um, they invited me down to Gloucestershire to to play with during the summer with the youth team. So I would spend the whole, whole summer. This would have been summer of sixty eight and sixty nine. So I went to Gloucestershire, I would spend the whole summer. Um, I would live with him, you know, and he and his wife Gwen, you know, really were great people. Um, you know they did everything <laughs> washing, cooking didn't have to I'm no family to them um, 
um, and these were English, these were English people. Um, and they really, I mean, they, 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 they made sure that I didn't want for anything. Um, so it took me into their house and I would spend the whole summer playing cricket with the, the youth team. So 68, 69, what they decided, during the summer, the, the boys, the young boys used to come from all over the place. And they used to, they used to actually sleep in the, the pavilion at the county ground, um, in the dress room. So they had sleeping bags and TVs and, and the coach's wife, Graham Butcher, would come in in the morning you know, cook breakfast for all the boys and everything, and and then obviously then they go off and play the matches during the day. That was all summer. So the '69, he said, look, you know, I think it would be good if you stayed with the boys and get me part of that. So I stayed with the boys in '69, and some of the boys that I stayed with then, now we are still very close friends. Some obviously became. Um, First class cricket is the same as myself. Some people like Andy Stubbold, um, who played for Gloucestershire for a long time, to this day we are still. Um, then there was David Grovney, who became Gloucestershire captain, England chairman of selectors. Um, so all of us grew up um, from that time. Um, so really Cyril Hammond was the one that really got me the opportunity to get into a first class. So then in 69, at the end of 69, obviously because I was so young, um, uh, I mean they were, and they were impressed. I was still t perhaps too young to come onto a full professional staff. So uh, MCC ran a, How can I put it? MCC used to have uh, something called uh, MCC Young Professionals. So it's really an opportunity for you to go and be an apprentice, to be an apprentice cricketer. So they really, you know, they would teach you the rudiments of being a, a first class cricketer. So I went to, so I went, they sent me up there for a trial. Um, you know, I impressed them with the trial and got offered a, a contract on the MCC Young Professionals. So, so people like Ian Bothan and myself went there together. He came from Somerset, I came from Gloucestershire. Other people came from other counties. Other counties. Um, so I was there for 69 and 70 as a young professional. And as a young professional, what you did, um, you had two, there were two levels. When you first come in, there was an A staff and a B staff. And the A staff basically was a pecking order. The A staff were people who'd been in that system for a while and obviously were the, you were no, you were a new boy. So a new boy, no, no new boy started in the A. And there was a difference in pay too. So I started in, in the B. So both them and myself started in the B. The A staff, fortunate for me also in the A staff, that the head boy, was also st from Stevenage, a, a fellow by the name of Bill Jones. So he was the he was the head boy of the, in terms of you know he'd been there the longest and he was the. And then I also had, um, for those two years, you know, two terrific coaches, different in their ways. Um, a guy by the name of Len Munster, who was ex cricketer, um, Len was from, he's a Welshman, and he, at that time, had a, he ran a sports shop just around the corner from Lord's, but he was the head coach of the M MCC Young Professionals. Uh, and he just took, liked me and took me under his wing and looked after me and made sure that I got wherever I wanted and everything. And then the other one was a fellow called Harry Sharp, who was an ex-Middlesex player. Um, later on in life when I was at Middlesex, Harry came back as a scorer for Middlesex. But Harry Sharp, different to Len, Len was more 
gentle and you know and Harry Harry was a very straightforward guy there was no great but a really nice guy so those two guys looked after me um, for those two years 1969 and 70 um, and obviously being at, being at Lords for that period um, you know you gave Middlesex the opportunity to to see the players um, so Middlesex um, offered me a contract a three-year contract in 1970 to to be a full-time professional now w what I didn't realize at the time was that really I, I, I had an obligation to Gloucestershire but those, those are the ones who sent me there but because obviously because of your desire my desire from a kid to be a, a cricketer suddenly here was this opportunity um, and nobody to I didn't have any mentors or anything to so obviously you know you take it um, Gloucestershire obviously once they found out were not too pleased um, and quite rightly so because you know they had invested they had invested in me um, but I think going to Middlesex proved to be the right move um, And in actual fact, I, I then scored my very first first class hundred against Gloucestershire, which was a bit of a, <laughs> which was not a nice thing. But, but I think that, you know everything's for a reason. And so the move was the right one because as my life and career developed, it, it proved that you know it, it was the right thing. Okay, so you, you played for. Middlesex for a very, a very, I would say a very long time. Yeah, and then seven, 72 to end of 90. Yeah, yeah, so that's a very long time. Yeah. Um, what, during your time at the club, what would you describe as your, your best moments and your most memorable moments? Um, I would say there would be many. Um, I remember, I guess, my first 100 for the club. You, you know, that's something that you... Your very first first class hundred, you remember that? Um, first cup final you played in. Um, first cup final I played in. I, I, I played a major part in that final that we won. Um, yes, your first championship win. Um, you know, then you know, then your first international game. I mean, and also the other thing, which is significant, is when you awarded your county cap. Uh, and really, your county cap is something you have to earn because it it really gets you get it awarded to you really after ten years of sterling service to the first team. Ten years is not long. It's not a year or two. So when you get when you get awarded your county cap, um, sorry, the county cap comes not for ten years. You 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 awarded a benefit after ten years. So you, your county cap comes after a period of doing really well, and obviously it comes with an increase in pay and that sort of thing. So you have to earn your cap. So you get your county cap. And then you know when you get your county cap, you're now considered really one of the senior players. Um, obviously, your salary goes up um, to that level. Um, but then you must ten years of excellent performances in the team before you then get awarded a benefit. Right. So my benefit was in 1989. Um, so I, I would say those are the main, those would be the main highlights really. Um, and I guess very lucky to be playing all of my cricket at Lords really, which is a dream of a lot of cricketers who never get to play there. And I was playing there on a daily basis. Written in the book that you started playing club cricket in the West Indies for a particular period of time. How 
I'm a bit of, of us, like I said, I'm not a cricket animal. I know there's different times of the year, mm. and you, obviously you go and play in different countries. Um, how did that have an effect on you personally, and how did that affect your game? Um, well, basically, as you know, in, in those days, really, cricket was very much a summer sport, so you play till September, and then cricket didn't start back until April the next year, so it was really a case of coming home. So I was coming home really to St. Philip, um, East Point, and while I was here, um, some of the friends that I went to school with were involved with local cricket playing for YMPC, so they said, look, why don't you come and play with us? So I went to YMPC and played. So Collis King, myself, Joe Garner, William Bourne, we all played at YMPC. Um, so it was just a case of really playing while I was here, um, till I go back to England. Uh, so it, it really was a, a relaxing period for me nice. during the winter to be out of the cold, <laughs> um, you know, to be here. So that 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 was for a while, and you know, and I played for Barbados, you know, when I was here during that period. Um, but then, obviously, later on in my career, that changed because more opportunities became available to play cricket overseas in the winter. So, obviously I would then play cricket in England till September, and then, you know, then play in Australia from September to April, or New Zealand, or you'd be touring during the winter. So then later on, you know, it was less and less that I was coming back because you know, I was now, it was my profession, I was working for, when I was back here, I'm spending money. I wasn't earning money, so obviously Australia, New Zealand, those places became more of a lucrative. lucrative. And then obviously by that time I was married and, you know, you can't just leave your family in, in England and come here for, for six months. So instead, you know, I, they would go with me to Australia. The kids were young, they would go to school in those places. And, so it was a great learning opportunity for them and, and they were obviously with me all the time so that's what happened during that period. Would you say that had a long lasting impact on your children in terms of the people that they developed into? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that, 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 um, that type of education you can't pay for. Um, I mean my, my, my daughter, she went to Australia when she was about a month old, so she spent the first six months of her life in England, in, in Australia. Um, obviously my, sister, my son, he went to school there. And then later on, we were in New Zealand, they were older, so, you know, I went to school there for the six months. So those sort of experiences of, and different cultures and different peoples, you know, they, they traveled with me to India and other places, so they saw different things, so I would hope and I know that those type of experiences have formed, um, you know, their, their characters later on because um, you, you have to be in those places to really experience what, it, what it's like. Um, you know, if you just stay in England, you just see everything from that point of view. So the experiences for them, and, and, <clears throat> and the schools recognize that, you know, it would be really good for them, and they and they sort of never ever attempted to stop them from doing. They encouraged them to go that. You know, it was something worth doing. Oh, so you got support from the schools. Yeah, 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 oh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Sure. Because yeah. you know, these days you take your take child it. Out, out for five minutes, they want to call the police. Yeah, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> they, they they felt that the the experience would be would be greater than. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so going just touching a bit more directly back on cricket, who would you say are some of the best players? It doesn't have to be the best, I mean, it could be because you know, not necessarily the best players make the best team in any sport. Um, who are the most, the players that you enjoy playing with, uh, with the, the most or playing against the most? Well, listen, I, I, I was very fortunate within my, my cricket career to play you know, with and against you know, some of the great cricketers of all time. Um, 
you know, Middlesex, obviously we had some great players. Um, Mike Brady was a great leader. You know, we had Mike Gatting. Uh, Vincent van der Beyl played one season with him as South African. Uh, towards the end of his career, one of the best bowlers I've ever seen. You know, we and Daniel, Fred Titmus, Phil Edmonds. You know. um, it you know. sounds a bit like you, <laughs> you keep mentioning names, you don't want to miss anyone out. Is that the amount of great well, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's so many you, you, you can't miss, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, and I enjoyed my time at Middlesex, you know, we had a great time. You know, sorry, you had Sylvester Clark, who was. Barbadian, you know, Waka Yunus, a great Pakistani, into Alam, great Pakistani. Essex, you know, Graham Gooch, great player, Keith Boyce, a Barbadian. Um, and then Kent, you know, you had, you had some of their great players, Pakistani, Akis, Asif Iqbal, you had Derek Underwood, Alan Knott, great England players. And then Hampshire, you had Barry Richards, superb South African player, one of the best cricketers ever. Gordon Greenwich, Barbadian, Malcolm Marshall, Barbadian. Um, you know, Gloucestershire, Mike Proctor, South African, Zahir Abbas, who I spent time with as a youngster at Gloucestershire. You know, you come to Somerset, you had Ian Botham, Viv Richards, Joe Garner, wow. Sinun Gavaska, Martin Crow, all those guys played against them. Good Morgan, Majid Khan, Northamptonshire, Safraz, Nawaz. Workshire, you know, you had Rohan Kanai there, Dennis Amis. Worcestershire had some great players, Basil Dolivera, as you know, for South Africa, Graham Hick, Glenn Turner from us, from New Zealand. And Leicestershire, of course, Andy Roberts from Antigua. Um, they had Winston Benjamin there as well. The Lancashire, you know, Clive Lloyd, Michael Holland, Colin Croft. At Yorkshire, you had Jeff Boycott, you know, one of the greatest players the game has ever seen. Illingworth, Raymond Illingworth. You know, then at Sussex, you had Kepler Vessels, Imran Khan, who is now <laughs> Premier of Pakistan. <laughs> Javid me and that. And then at Nottingham, Nottinghamshire, you had you had Richard Hadley, one of the greatest bowlers ever. Clive Rice, Sir Garfield Silvers. <laughs> Um, uh, Derbyshire, Eddie Barlow, South African captain, Michael Holden. So the list really goes on. Yeah. These are just some of the names of the players that, you know, I've played with and played against. And then obviously, you know, the England team that I played in contains some of the greatest players England have ever had. You know, you had Gooch, you had Boycott, you had David Gower, you had Bob Willis. You know, you go down the line. Um, that's just, that's just, to me, that's just amazing, the amount, the caliber. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, those, <laughs> those are yeah. exceptional world class players. Well, so. I think it's probably more, it's not just being playing against those players of the caliber, it's knowing that you're of that caliber or even better as well. Which is probably uh, one of the things that you'll take to the grave. Hopefully, the grave is not. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 but no, you, 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 you'll take it well, whenever, whenever it is, but. Um, no, you're right. I mean, and and we conquered all of those all of those players during that period because within that period, Middlesex were by far the most successful side. Um, you, know, you know, during my period, we won about six championships and six one day cup trophies. So you would have conquered these all of these players here during that period. So you know, it was very satisfying to be able to do that. Um, and to be part of a team that achieved that type of success. 1981, a very significant year for you, I would say. Um, been playing professional cricket for 12 years, if my calculation is correct. Well, the, I, 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 I made my debut in 74. I joined Middlesex in 72. Okay. I played my first game in 74. Okay. And, um, well, in 1981, even I think there was some suggestion by your wife in the book that maybe you should have played it earlier. Well, I did, but I played in eighty actually. Yeah. I, 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 my first game for England was in nineteen eighty um, against Australia. Um, so I was, I, I was, so I was picked for the one day international against Australia in nineteen eighty, and then I came to the Caribbean in eighty one um, with England. So eighty really was my first, my first international. Okay. So do you feel? How could I say? So 1980s are more significant thing for you? Well, yeah, because that was the breakthrough. 
I mean, that was, um, you know, your, your first game really, so that was that was a one day international. Obviously, my first test match was in, in West Indies here in Barbados, actually. Um, but, you know, that first game, the two different type of game, but, um, you know, to pick for England for the first time is, is, you know, it was. It wasn't something that I was. I was playing well enough. I wasn't expecting it, but it was a pleasant surprise. Um, given that <laughs> you was living in England at a time where I would say cricket was very popular amongst the West Indian Caribbean diaspora in England at the time, um, considering that you lived in England where the, the game is popular and you lived amongst the West Indians as well, what was it like having? that you had played for England as a West Indian and obviously you was between those two communities, obviously the, the society that you live mm. in and your own personal community, what was that like? Because you must have had people conversing with you about this situation a lot or bringing it up or even you might, even if they weren't bringing it up, you must have been thinking about it yourself as a Barbadian, someone born in Barbados, now in England. Yeah, I think, um at the time when I played, it, it was obviously I was the first, so it's it was something new. But it, but what it did was it, it made all the other youngsters who wanted to play cricket believe that if they did well enough, they would get the opportunity. And um, you know, so the likes of Deva Malcolm and Dustin Small and Will Slack and Neil Williams and Norman Cohen's. Um, you know, those guys then got the belief that, hang on a minute, you know, if I do well enough, I could get a chance. And uh, and they all did in the end. So, uh, you know, it, it really was a um, a door opener, really. You open the doors and um, let people have a look and see, look, yeah, I can I can go through that door as well. So I, I felt proud of that, that I was able to, you know, even though it wasn't a long international career, that I was able to at least, you know, prize open the doors for others to squeeze through. Um, at that time, I guess, there were a lot of people of West Indian heritage, youngsters of West Indian heritage, and some youngsters born in England of West Indians, who really looked at cricket as, a, as something important. And their parents did. I can't say that's the case now because um, I would say most most of the people of my kids generation has no affiliation with the cricket born in England none whatsoever um, but you said um, if they have got any affiliation with anything it is it's for football but during my time it was during the period of great dominance by the West Indies. So people who had migrated from the Caribbean with the love of cricket was the dominant performances by the West Indians really kept them alive in England. Um, kept them alive. It kept them alive. Um, you know, it, it also made their lives a little bit more tolerable. Um, then I guess before that, where life was very hard for the rain rush, the rain rush generation. Um, but the success of the West Indies team made people, you know, hold their heads up high and, and felt proud. And so sadly, our children don't have that same sort of attachment to my feelings, to the Caribbean. My feelings. What has caused that? Because some people, funny enough, I was listening to a radio station in Antigua, Antigua Observer Radio, that I listen to now and again, and there's a guy called Jojo Aparicio, who does a sports show, and I, mm. I like to listen to it. And um, he, there was talking about, I'm, I'm guessing you saw the article on the BBC website about where has the English Black River gone that came out this week? No, I haven't seen it this, this week. There's one that's but, come out this week. Yeah. And they were saying certain things and I was listening to them but I personally think when I speak think of Vincent the person that I was mentioning mm. 
he came, he's from Tottenham. And if I look, the thing what I find out certain is that I've been coming, I know England's a country of 60 million, 50 million people. So everybody's all over. I've seen sports stars from various sports, but I've hardly ever seen an English cricketer in close proximity to wherever I've been socialising yeah. or being about. Yeah. But I've been to the Caribbean, I've seen Curly Ambrose walking down the road, I've seen Richie Richardson, I've seen Junior Murray, I've seen loads of people walking down the road, just normal people. I understand it's a smaller island. Yeah. Yeah. So I think my personal opinion is partly to do with the class system. I might be wrong. Or is it just a thing that we not my generation because I would have I was born in so it's a bit different um, was it just football was just so overpowering and so or was it an accessible because it was just a ball and you only had to buy a ball and play in the street what, what caused that? Of, I, well, I, think, I think yeah football is accessible as you said you, you just need a ball you don't need a lot of space um, and as you know now um, you know, space is an issue in particularly in the cities of, of, of the UK. Um, but, you know, any little space, they can still kick a football, even against a wall or whatever. So it is easy to get that. And, and if you're not getting the push from your family in a particular direction, you know, and, and West Indian families in, in England are generally concerned about work and survival. You know, they go to work to try and provide for their kids. They do not spend a lot of time. They don't spend a lot of time with their kids' pursuits. So the kid is left to his own devices in terms of what sport he's going to play. So the easiest and cheapest sport to play, and everybody else is playing, is football. So of course to get involved with that. Um, I think parental support or lack of is, is a real problem. Um, in England um, with cricket and they don't have that attachment with the Caribbean and what cricket means to the Caribbean anymore mm -hmm. persons born in England um, they see themselves of Engl as English they're, they're not all fair with the history of West Indies cricket and what it has meant and you know how it started how they got out how they, they, they're not they don't know and, and they don't care well, like, I don't want to stop you midway but I feel I sense something when you were saying that mm. is that a sense of just you analysing the situation or is that a sense of disappointment or is it just you being well, 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 it is both but I, I, I'm a realist and I, and I can understand how it's happened um because once survival becomes your number one um, thing, you know, quite often you haven't got the time, you haven't got the energy, you're too consumed with doing two jobs and, and, and stuff to make sure that your, your family meets, ends meet. So to then go out with your son and sit down with your son and tell him about how West Indies rose from the ashes to be this great domineering and what it means or what it meant to my father here in, in England who came here in the Bingrush generation discriminated against and then the West Indies beating everybody all over the world what it meant to him that he could go to work tomorrow with his chest pushed up and, f and feel you know what you know I feel as a black man that he's even if it's only for a day you feel something so p parents do really don't have the time and as I said a lot of them don't really know the history either because they're born in England. They're not really they're English. They can tell you more about English history than the Caribbean. And another bad thing about a lot of our people are is that they're just you you yeah, you'll have people that's probably never been back to the Caribbean for twenty, thirty years. That's that's insane. You know? Yeah. So really that the so so they don't know what's going on, they're not interested, they they've lost um, and that and that is a, it just spirals on and on and on and on. So I am not going to just say that I'm blaming them because circumstances, you know, can dictate what happens. But it is much much easier, and, and football is in your face day in day out. You know, so 
and it, and they market it extremely well. Now cricket, as you said, because it's an expensive sport, it's, an, it's probably an upper class sport. Um, it is not marketed like football is. I mean, football is football is marketed to the masses. Cricket is not. Cricket is still you know, fairly reserved. You know, maybe we only want a certain type of person. Um, but as you say, where are the black cricketers? Very, very few. I mean, th there's only one black coach. And I, I find it very interesting because. I look at other communities and the ones that play cricket, for example, and I think to myself, wow, they managed to maintain that. Whereas with us, it's just, it, it's pretty much gone. It's, it's pretty much gone. And I think that's a very sad thing. I think it's a very, very sad thing because as the generations move on, I kind of, I, I, I probably give credit to my mother because if she didn't encourage me to, to go and read certain things, and I was interested in it myself, if I'm being honest, I probably wouldn't know anything about the Caribbean. And I feel that a lot of us in England, even at my age, because I'm probably an older person, I'm not so much a young person anymore, young, but yeah. not young, I've been 30, and it's music and food, a culture doesn't just exist to music and food, wow. and, uh, and you become extremely deluded by that. And it's, um, well, well, to, yeah, it's to, just, uh, to a lot of the Caribbean people, well, and 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 not just Caribbean people, people, other people see the Caribbean about that music and food. That is, that is how it's viewed, um, and I guess, I guess here we 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 encourage that type of stereotype view <laughs> as well, you know that. You know, it's only music and food. I mean, it's. Uh, and it says for cricket, boy, I really don't know how you're going to get that resurgence of young Caribbean people in, I, in, I, in I, England. I think, it, I think it's personally gone. That's yeah. just me. Yeah. And also, the, the way the West Indies is performing at yeah. the moment is going to have an impact on that quite a significant. And and that's and that's been happening for twenty years. So really, you know, you've had where for fifteen years you had you could walk like this. You know, the people who are still interested in cricket for twenty years, you know, got to hide and walk with their head down. Um, so just the performances of the team in twenty years would not have lifted any spirits of people in England. So I think you might be right. Of that demise, do you think? What do you account that to? Because I kind of started, when I started watching cricket, I think I watched at the peak, not a peak at where the demise started happening. So Yeah, um, there's no one reason, there's lots of reasons for that. Um, I think, I think the rest of the world learnt from our success and planned better and because of their size and and the amount of money they have available, they're able to do certain things that we couldn't do. Um, so then things like sports science and sports medicine became much more important to the game of, 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 of cricket. So they have they'd invested great sums in the development of their players, uh, not just as cricketers, but then the academies and sports psychologists etc etc so so while we were dominating we were dominating in an era of talent um, so we were much more talented more athletic and we dominated during that period but they they learned they learned that we may be less talented we may be less athletic but with proper planning and financing that we can do that. So they've done that. Now, I think we've also become, of, it's happening now actually, we have, we have, we have, it's payback now. We also became complacent with our success that this was a, this was our heritage, this cricket is our heritage, that this is something that will continue 
forever whenever we want a great player one will emerge um, which meant that we didn't put enough thought into long-term planning of the sport so when the rough times came it was like what can we do no you're behind the eight ball so the others are forging ahead and you are now trying to catch up um, you know we're now investing in starting to invest in academies now when Australia did it in 1980 you know, so they've had 38 years of experience <laughs> we, we, we're now really trying to get something so uh, a combination of things I would say um, we, were, we, we were not sharp enough or our people were not our leaders were not smart enough to to understand that things were in cycles and nobody dominates forever um, so we got carried away with the whole thought of sweeping the world and now it's the other way around we, we, we're the one being trodden on and, and once you get in trodden on it it's much harder to get up <laughs> it's kind of i have a kind of imf feel about it because i remember you mentioning something about the gate money mm. in terms of when you go when the west indies play overseas they get a very small proportion of great gate money and whereas in the west indies uh, you're not making the gates yeah yeah that that, that that has contributed to the where is it contribute that that has ensured that the demise continued um, because in the in the, in the glory days when west indies were winning they were like the as the top team you you basically negotiated your terms right so west indies going i'm not saying that we were great negotiators because we weren't our, our people were not great negotiators because we were dominating the sport but we negotiated always on a much lower level than we should have um, i remember a series in australia five test series five one internationals the deal that we negotiated with australia we were the champion team the top team everybody wanted us that at the end of the first test match australia had paid back everything that west indies had asked for etc the next four test matches and one day internationals were profits for australia that was that was the, our negotiators not understanding what it meant to be number one but in those days, that's what happened. You negotiated with the opposition. So you, you negotiate and you agree on what you get on the tour. Right. Now, when that changed to become the future tours, so I mean they're called the future tours. Now, future tours now means that the home team keeps all the revenue. Right. So now West Indies go to Australia. Australia have stadiums of 50,000 plus paying Australian dollars which is a strong currency they keep the money Australia comes to West Indies and you get 5,000 people in Kensington over paying 10 Barbados dollars and in Trinidad some EC dollars down in Antigua right now, when those series are over, you can't even cover the the food bill or the flights or the accommodation. So Australia and India and those teams are making huge sums from every home series, which goes into their reserves. And we, 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 we're scratching because we, we're not getting a share of... Where before, when you play in India, you negotiated, look, and you got a share of what? So the future tours has it's continued to harm us, um, and um, it's, it's made sure that we stayed. As much as they talk, it's made sure that you stayed on the floor okay. with no power at all. Wow. Okay. Well, um, I'm just going to move on to two quick things. Yeah. Um, Jaffa Archer. Yeah. <coughs> what do you personally think of that, considering he was raised? in the Caribbean entirely, as far as I know. Um, he's gonna wait out five years, it seems, or four and a half, if I remember correctly, to play for England. 
Um, yeah, but you can understand why he's doing that because, I mean, he can play five years of county cricket and, and have an extremely good living. You know, you know he, he, he can earn 60, 70 thousand pounds a year just playing county cricket. Do that for five years, right? But, but he, he can't earn that in the Caribbean. Um, so, you know, he has an English passport, you know. Um, and I guess, you know, he felt perhaps that he was not treated correctly here. Um, you know, so, he, you know, Christopher Jordan, you know, same thing. You know, Chris played, Chris, Chris, Chris played here um, for Barbados as well. Um, obviously, he's in that situation. <coughs> um, the next one to look out for, you've got a young boy. He's a white boy. Uh, by the name of Jacob, Jacob Bethel, he's only 15, he's, no, he's under 15, but he's Barbadian born and everything, he's been Barbados on the, he's been playing there on the 15 team, he's been picked for the under 17, West Indies picked him for the under 15 team, but they, they turned it down, because Warwickshire, Warwickshire group, got him up there, going to school and everything. So they've, tur so they've turned on, playing for the West Indies on the 15th. So, <coughs> you know. The, the brain drain is now affecting cricket. Yeah, 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 yeah of course. And he's one of our brightest young cricketers. Um, but, you know, that, that, that's, that's life, that's what's going to happen. And, you know, we, we, Where we really struggle is that in the certainly in my time and before, up to the nineties, England was a great breeding ground for our players. Right? Those opportunities are not available anymore. And we don't have the support mechanism in this region to or competition to develop our young cricketers. So in England you had people being developed from club level all the way through. You know, somebody played for a club in London, somebody played in Lancashire League, played, played in Durham League, some played county cricket. So you had development at all levels. Now, that's not, can't happen. Can't happen. Because now, the Home Office now has brought in, they have a new policy called Managed Migration. And it's not designed to, I mean, some of my colleagues here, Try to. Some of my colleagues try to make things black and you know black v white, um, but I. That's not my view. My view is, you know, it's a policy they designed, because England are trying to, they're trying to close their borders. Since 9/11, people have got very edgy, and they're trying to close the borders. But what this migration managed migration policy does, and it affects all sports. Where before. Clubs in England, if you were a cricketer here, a club cricketer could get you to come up and play for them and they'd pay you a little bit of money and so that's finished. Managed migration policy also says that in order to get a work permit, you must be a current first class player in your country and you must have played five games in the last year. But the worst part is that anyone who has represented their country at under 17 level, from under 17 upwards, is deemed to be on the pathway to a professional. So if you're on the pathway, you cannot get a, you can't get a, a permit to work because you, you're on the pathway. And, and well, the way that is so damaging is that you may have played for Barbados under 17 10 years ago and you never played since then for any representative site but you were on the pathway to being a professional you, you, that is a classification so you can't go and apply to get a visa to go and play cricket in England because you don't have you're not in the current Barbados team and you haven't, you haven't played 5 games this year and that's you replicate that all around the Caribbean. That's what it's like now. 
but I've just used the Caribbean as an example but that is what is happening now in all sports around the world so the Indians have the same problem the Pakistanis the Australians New Zealanders the South Africans um, so it, it's a convenient way for England to I guess before they used to think particularly in the West Indies case we are developing you to then come and beat us that was a but we we don't have the resources to um, have things in place to so I expect we, we're going to struggle for we're going to struggle for a long time <laughs> well um, before I move on man, we'll get through the last bit very quickly uh, before we move on uh, you talked about we 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 in 1981 or the 80s or during that West Indian dominance, how did you feel considering you played for England? Because that must have been interesting What, in terms of what was going through your mind because you're here as an English player, you're proud to play for England, mm -hmm. but you're also proud of being a West Indian, West Indian heritage. Um, how did that feel? Or was you just had a, a professional approach to what... Well, I mean, uh, very much. For, for me, it was, a, you know, it was a fulfillment of what I dreamed as a kid, um, to be... You know, test cricketer. So that's first and foremost that um, I was going to play test cricket, and I guess it it had another edge to it that here I was playing my first test match in Barbados, the place of my birth, but for a foreign team. So that was, you know, that was different. That's not something that I envisaged as a as a child growing up. I wanted to play test cricket, but. So this was something different, something new. So, you know, there was excitement at playing, um, excitement of being able to play in Barbados at Kensington Oval and in front of my family and friends. Um, but, I, you know, I also knew the task ahead was a, a very difficult one because, you know, West Indies were rampant at that time. So, you know, so it, it, it was a, a very hard and stressful it, it was it was good but obviously it was a, it was a very difficult um, time as well because you know at no time in the history of the game has West Indies has ever been so strong well, what was that um, when you made your debut at, or test at Kensington Oval mm -hmm. what, what do you remember from before that what's the most significant things you remember from that day was it like a source of pride or was it like, uh, well, how did you feel on that day? What was going through your mind? It was, it was a source of pride. Pride here am I considered to be one of the the best players in a, in a population of 40 million. Um, first black person to be picked for England. Something that's never hap happened before. To be playing in, in Barbados, the place of your birth really all the dots were lined up so to speak um, so for me it certainly was a, a sense of pride um, that you know this is what I have achieved um, the you know it, it, it then turned really I had mixed feelings really what turned what started as a very proud and satisfying event really turned out to be quite a to be quite a sad event really because on the second day of the test match our assistant manager had a heart attack and died so that really took the shine off the occasion because never mind how excited you are about an event um, a death is <laughs> a death then puts everything into perspective so um, so it was, it was difficult. It was it was really was difficult after that. Beat on ridiculous letter. Did you ever keep that letter? Oh yeah, I still have it now. I mean, no, that 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 was in England before the, um, before I actually came to the Caribbean. It was just obviously when the team was announced and my name was there. Um, I, I I got this letter from some. I don't know, some Caribbean person who didn't take it kindly that a, a Caribbean person was playing for England, you know, so his, 
you know, he addressed me, Dear Butcher, you know, um, he then accused me of dragging Barbie, dra dragging black people back into the days of slavery. And then went on to say, um, Judas was paid 30 pieces of silver. How many were you paid? <laughs> <laughs> Which I found quite amusing. So I, I still have the letter. Um, but, you know, that, that, that was a one-off yeah. um, situation. You know, most people, most people viewed it as an achievement. But, but obviously, obviously he was, you know, it, to him it was more than cricket, um, to this guy, so <laughs> everyone to their own opinions. Okay. Uh, um, there's a question I posed that fortunately you achieved quite a lot in cricket, uh, but unfortunately you had a severe injury in 1983 regarding your eye. Um, what did it take for you to recover? to and return to your high standard because I know from reading the book it seemed like a very very extremely frustrating period yeah yeah that was perhaps the worst part period of my career that was um, this, you know the sad thing about it was that I would played for England in 81 uh, so I didn't obviously I hadn't played after the West Indies series um, 82, winter of 82, 83, I was in Australia playing for Tasmania um, with Michael Holden. We were the two overseas players for Tasmania. And so 82, 83, and I was playing really well. I mean, uh, in Australia, I was playing well, and I came back, started the season in 83, and I was batting really well and I felt that this was the time I was going to be recalled. I was in, you know, I was in tremendous form and I, I really felt within myself and the way the game was going that I would, I would, this, I would be recalled for England this year. And um, I remember playing a game at Lord's beginning of July and I really had a excellent season and George Ferris from another Antiguan <laughs> uh, who's a very close friend of mine George you know he just bowled a short ball and I just went to hook missed it it struck me just right below the eye there um, and that really then put put pay to not just that season but after that because obviously then it, it affected my sight and stuff so even though I was able to play I came back in 84 and I was able to play another six years it was never was never the same player again so that that was that was a sad thing about that and then it was and it was a long road back I mean obviously I was determined to come back because what choice did I have I mean I was a professional cricketer um, I wasn't a doctor or a lawyer as a professional cricketer, so I had to find all means to, to, to get back in, you know, and, and I played a game again, but it was, it was not, it was extremely difficult, extremely difficult, you know, I had to have, had a few operations, first operation, because with a, with a multiple fractures like that, um, you know, your jaw literally drops down to here. Um, and it's a fairly complicated um, operation. So in order to do the operation, um, you know, they have to cut you here on, on the inside of your mouth and they work that way. Um, now the, the first operation they did um, didn't work. Um, you know, so they did the cut and they did the operation and they tried to wire the bones together but it wouldn't, um, it didn't work. So, uh, so then they decided after that the next operation that they're going to have to do is um, they, they're going to have to pin it from the outside once they've done that, which means you'll have the steel thing around your head and it will be pinned from the outside. I remember going into the operating theatre and 
you know, that was the last thing they said was going to happen. And um, when I woke up from the operation, obviously the first thing I did was feel for this. You know, and it wasn't there. Uh, you know, and I, at that point, I thought I was in heaven <laughs> because I, I didn't, I couldn't feel this, and so I panicked. And, you know, and sort of asked what happened. So they said, well, at the last minute, they decided to you know, try the, the other one. So they didn't go off that. But, as I said, the result of that really was then, you know, loss of some of the sight in the eye. And it was a long process back. Um, you know, you know. It's very interesting that, uh, obviously that affects your health, but it's something that happened a long time ago and you're very still, ref very reflective about it. It's very... Yeah, because, because for me, it, it really, it finished my international career. Uh, and at a time where I was ready to re resume my international career, so it was um, it was pretty devastating. It was, you know, but I, I, I was proud that I was able to fight uh, to get back on the park in in, in 1984. Um, so it took that long to to rehab uh, part of '84 and then another six years so you know I, I was proud of that um, but it was a long it was a long road and as I said it changed it changed the direction of my life really okay. um, <laughs> I kind of want to get these type of um, questions out of the way but the next one is unfortunately one of your teammates who has a sports ground named after him in French League of London Will Slack yeah. passed away in 1989. What are your fondest memories of him from a sporting and personality perspective? Well, Wirth we're, 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 we're was my my best friend at Middlesex. There's no question we were we were very close. Um, you know, we, sh we shared a flat in Finchley. You know, we shared a flat in, in, in Hammersmith as well. So we were very, very close. We were good friends. Um, so it was shocking. Um, it really started in when he went to Australia with England. Um, was the first time it just happened. It just during the game it just collapsed, um, and they did all the tests in Australia. Could find nothing. Came back to England. Um, they did all the. Harley Street, everybody did all the tests, they could find nothing wrong with him. Um, but it would happen from time to time, you know, he would be, but then he would say, you know, if, if it happens, just turn him on his side and he, he'll be okay. So that's what used to happen, I mean, if, in a few games where it happened, he'd be batting or whatever. And he would just, and just fall over. So you would turn him on, on his side and within a minute or so, you know, he's fine, he got, and, he, and he goes. Um, but he went on a tour, he went on a tour to the, Z to the Gambia, um, early in 89. That was the same way of my benefit because he was, he was going to come back, obviously, to come to my first benefit function, the opening. So he was just he was just batting, played a ball, ran to the other end. There was a second run. He was turning for the second run. Just went down on one knee and bent over, and that was it. Then later on, obviously, they found out that really what the problem was was a blocked artery, and they said that if 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 when he was passing out. That if anybody had, if they'd felt for a pulse, you would see there was no pulse, and then they would have known it was a blood artery. But by the time a medical person always got from the pavilion to the field, he was he was always back up, right? So um, obviously none of the players ever, you know, medically trained, never felt for a pulse. You know, we just turn him on the side. And by the time the physio ran on there, he would be. But 
that's what they said. If you'd felt, you realize there'd be no pulse, and they would have known it was a block artery, and then obviously that could have been dealt with um, quite easily. But that was a sad time for me because, as I said, we were, we were, he was my closest friend in cricket for sure. Uh, do you still feel that, I'm going to ask this question in a different way, do you still like, you feel like you're a bit of a, a perfectionist now? Because in the book you go on about how you was training very, as you later down your career, you actually realise that less is more. Yeah. In, in, in a respect, but do you feel you're still much of a perfectionist? Yeah, I'm a perfectionist in the sense that I do like perfection. Um, but I'm also a realist as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I guess that's probably changed from being perfectionist now to uh, to excellence. I believe in excellence. If you're going to do something, you know, do it to the best of your ability, or don't do it. So that will never leave me. I, I don't like things being done half halfway. Um, so in many sense, yeah, I'm a, still a perfectionist, but in a different way. Um. Who would you say is the biggest, who was the biggest support in your career? Actually, you've kind of mentioned that quite a bit. You've mentioned multiple people. Yeah. Was there anyone off the cricket field, you would say? Um, I think my mother, my mother, my, my mother never missed a game. Uh, particularly at weekends when I was at Middlesex. She would come from Stevenage on her own, on the train, sit in the stand and watch the match. Um, and that was every Saturday, Sunday. Um, you know, she you know, she didn't talk a lot about, but she was very proud. You know, um, uh, so she was always there. She was always there. Never missed a game. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about becoming the captain of the club? Uh, what significance did that hold for you? Um, well, great significance. I mean, you you've now actually you've just touched on something that I didn't even pay a, a great deal of attention to because right now yeah, yeah. Right, now, right now there's a guy in England writing a book um, afterwards I'll show you the he's writing a book on the first it's called Footballing Pioneers mm -hmm. and it's about the first black to play football for the 92 English clubs okay. the very first clubs you know, and hi, and his research has found that I was the first one to play for Stevenage. Wow! Is it Phil, <laughs> in football? Is it Phil Fasani or is it? No, uh, Bill, Hearn. Bill, Bill Hearn. Bill Hearn. Bill Hearn is his name. Wow! And the first black footballer for um, Tottenham Hotspur was a uh, Walter, Walter Tell from Barbados. Barbados. Yeah. Um, actually, there was a movement to know give him the credit that he deserves. The British High Commissioner here, she started the movement that this guy deserves. He was also obviously the first officer in there. Um, but, so this guy is now doing this book. So he's, he, he when he brought that into the, the, the equation about Middlesex as well, the first black one there, that's something I hadn't paid a lot of attention to. Um, so yes, I mean, obviously, you know, History is what it is. Yeah, so I'm very proud to be to be the the first black captain. I I'm going to make an assumption. You prefer Test cricket to 2020. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> I, I think because of the generation I came from. Yeah. I, I I still I still maintain Test cricket is it is what it is. The ultimate test over a long period. Um, I, I I appreciate. The shorter form of the game, you know, T20 for what it is, it, it is, it is entertainment, it's a spectacle, um, but, I mean, and obviously the players have learned new skills for that game, but it is not the ultimate test. Um, test cricket is the ultimate test. Your, your technique is tested, your mentality is tested, your bravery is tested, you know. All of those are the things. In, in T20, none of those things are. It's bang, you have a goal. 
So you, you don't they don't test your bravery because you got it's just zero involved. To yeah, us, yeah. You know, you're the test cricket people ball kind of you know regulate your head and your body. You know you got to you got to be mentally tough. You know you got to concentrate for long periods. You know. So those are the those are the things. As I said, it's probably a generational thing. I came from a generation where test cricket was. But I I don't have a problem with the other forms. I watch it. I enjoy it. Um, but it doesn't come near. I'm afraid. You learn a lot more money, but. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> true. Uh, okay, so that I've had to come to Barbados in to, for me to actually speak to you. Yeah. So how did you end up? Back in Barbados, what were you doing? Um, that's, that's another chapter of my life, actually. Um, actually, the the person who brought me here is Professor Sir Henry Beckles. And actually, he, he, he's the one that keeps telling me that I should, you know, write the next chapter because I've been here now 14 years. Um, really, he encouraged me to come. He was principal of, of the campus. Uh, and it came about really, I mean, to be honest, I had no, I'll tell you, I had no intention of coming back to Barbados to live. That was never in my plans, I'll be honest with you. Um, obviously, my children were in England. Um, that's where I was really settling. Um, and my long-term plan really was to, was to live part of the year in England, part of the year in Cyprus. That was my plan. Cyprus? Yeah. Oh, I thought he was. I made an assumption because I know commonly many people do six months here, six months. No, Cyprus. Cyprus. I'll tell you what. Be, because we had a house in Cyprus, right? So we had a house built in Cyprus in about 1990. Um, so my children, that's where they spent their summers. Uh, and so Cyprus is one of the most fantastic places you can go, just like all Barbados. Same family, community. Tremendous place. Same weather, except hotter. Um, <laughs> I know all my colleagues at work. Yeah, yeah, beautiful beaches. You know, people really nice. Food, uh, and I we started going there in sort of late eighties with a a friend of mine who was a Greek Cypriot, and his wife English. He kept saying, "Look, you must come to Cyprus." So we went and just loved the place. So we had a house built in nineteen ninety. I only actually I only sold it in two thousand and six. Once we decided to settle that we were going to stay here, but summers we used to go there. My wife would go and spend the summer with the kids and stuff. So the plan really was six months in England in the summer and then the winter period in Cyprus. That was that was the plan. Um, I came to Barbados on a holiday. Um, I was an avid reader of Professor Beckel's perspective on cricket in the Caribbean and and obviously and he was someone that I could identify with because his his path was the same as mine. Yeah, he, went he went to, to England Berlin. at thirteen the same way, but he went to Birmingham and I went to London. Um, he wanted to be a cricketer too. It was at Warwickshire, but he was competing with Rohan Kanai, Alvin Kelly Turan. Um, Lance Gibbs, um, you know that crowd. Um, played, obviously, for his university. Played second eleven cricket and all that. So, it, so we had things in common. And I mean, and his love for cricket is perhaps even greater than mine. <laughs> so, uh, having read all of his books and everything, I thought it was it'd be interesting when I come down here to meet him and just have a discussion. Uh, so I called him up when I came here. I hadn't really spoken with him before. I called him up and said, oh, I'm in Barbados. Um, but actually, before I came, I contacted him to say, oh, I'm coming to Barbados. You know, can I come and see you? He said, yeah, great. I'd love, you know, love to have a chat. So I came and they went to university and we talked and whatever. And then, when we finished the day, we'd been there for a few hours and the conversation and whatnot, he said, um, He said, you know, Sammy, I'm, I'll be looking for a director of sport um, in a short while. <laughs> so this was 
something new because as I said I, I never had that in my plans to well obviously then I went back to England and I, and I told my wife what happened and I met Professor Beckles who really you know wanted to get sport going in the right direction because right? sport was not that serious on the campus at the time um, so then we started the discussions and uh, you know my wife didn't have a problem with with the venture so so anyway, he brought me in 2004 uh, to start the sports program uh, which we did um, uh, I'm still here in 2014 I'm still here uh, so I, I, I would say it's, it's going well and yeah I mean it's I mean we've achieved a, a tremendous amount um, in that period I miss most of it was when he was principal here so you know it was great having him to you know he wanted to go in a direction that I wanted to go in and um, you know so for the first two years you know my wife and myself just you know just see how things go see whether but then after two years we decided yeah yeah we'll, uh, we'll stay um, so that's when we built a house and it meant now we were a long way away from Cyprus, mm. so so we had to sell the place there. Um, but so I mean, this is it now, really. <laughs> so I'm here. What was it like coming back? Because in my experience, just observing like the the Caribbean and its mm. diaspora, you kind of have this hierarchical thing for me that I noticed. It's just my perspective. From people might not agree. So there's people that live in the Caribbean, born in the Caribbean. There's people that who go to like they live in the Caribbean, but they study abroad and they come back for the summer. Yeah. And then there's the people who were born in the Caribbean and live outside. And then there's the people who were born in the Caribbean, but they left as a child, but like very young. Well, there's the people that live outside the Caribbean that weren't born in the Caribbean that identify with the Caribbean, but they tell them that they're foreigners. So it's like you mentioned something about sometimes someone needs the West Indies for five minutes. And, and come back with, 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 with an accent. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what it's, was it like? it's, it's interesting. I mean, interesting. I mean, Barbados is one of the strangest places in the world. Um, I was born and bred in Barbados. Um, lived in England for 37 years. Frequently back in Barbados. And you know, and and I'm treated like a foreigner, basically. You know, people see you as a foreigner. Um, and Barbadians have this, particularly the ones who haven't been anywhere, have this view of themselves of knowing everything. Um, so at the time, you know, I, I've had a lot of frustrating times here in Barbados in that. You know, people just move too slow to do anything. Um, so here I was from first world country where you push, 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 get things done. And you come back and people are, you know, not wanting to move at the same speed as yourself. So that, that has been a frustrating part. But, you know, I've learned over the years that, you know, I, I'm not going to come down to their level. Um, but I, I, I have fun ways to get around their slowness of doing things um, but I've always kept in the back of my mind the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing and the end goal so the fact that you meet frustration at every at every moment um, doesn't stop you from from going towards the and, and, and I and I learned a lot from from Professor Beckles in that you know, he had the same upbringing as me in England for the same sort of period of time. So he's had to come back and he's come back as a person wanting to get things done. So he's obviously, he's gone through the same, because he wasn't always principal, you know, he really was a lecturer trying to get things done. And he had to work his way through to be principal. And obviously when he's principal then he could get things done. But still, within the Caribbean, people still regard, regard the university. And if you ask nine-tenths of the persons here, it would be about academics. 
right? Um, they don't see the same value in sports as someone like Professor Buckles, who's been exposed to, you know, so he, you know, his belief is that well, in the old days, promising sports persons when they went to universities had to make a choice um, that shouldn't be so, that at university you should be able to compete in sport at a high level as well as your academics, that it's managing the time um, and the two go together, that's his belief. Uh, you know, that is my belief too, so that's what's helped me to continue when, you know, you're not getting a lot of assistance, that, you know, you're doing this for a much bigger purpose, you know, you're, you know, so really we're continuing what he, what he started. Obviously he's now Vice Chancellor, so he's you know, in a more, so, you know, he's been the focal point of establishing the now Faculty of Sport, the first faculty that the University have had for 40 years the faculty of sport so sport is here to stay um, I will make my contribution um, now I'm sure somebody else at, in time will, will take it on but you know it hasn't been 14 easy years it's been you know tough but it's also rewarding A quick question what do you like about since you returned to Barbados what do you like most about Barbados and if there's anything um, I guess the punctuality and getting things done you probably missed about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I don't, I don't like, I don't like sloppiness or slowness in doing things. I, I as I said, I know believe excellence for me. If you can do it, I want you to do it well. Um, you know, that's that's one of the frustrating parts. Um, what I have got to know about Barbados is that um, obviously now I, I went to here when I was a boy so there wasn't a huge amount that I know that I knew about the place so you know now I'm back I'm, I'm, I'm finding out more um, also the fact that I'd been away from you know from your family for 37 years um, is something you've you know you've had to that you appreciate now um, and really you know the, the things that I that I'm involved with you know as you know I'm, I'm a board member director of the Barbies Cricket Association you know I'm, I was a board director of the Barbies Football Association um, you know I'm on the cricket committee of the West Indies cricket board um, do a lot of broadcasting Radio, TV. So I mean, I am now doing things that um that I wanted to do, that I want to do in sport, um, and I'm appreciating uh, you know, the, the 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 country a lot more than perhaps when I was in England. Uh, I I see also now the shortcomings of the country, which in England perhaps you don't see. Um, you, you know, in England you don't see the shortcomings of Barbados because you're not here living it. Um, and, and you don't get to understand what needs to be done. Um, hence, as I said, when those people don't come back to Barbados for 20, 30 years, really they, 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 they have no idea as to, as to what goes on here. Uh, and, you know, it's not an easy place for a lot of people, Barbados. It is, uh, you know, a lot of people in Barbados survive um, by the the good nature of their families overseas, uh, and, and I, at times I don't think the overseas, even though you you know you're helping your family, I don't think you really understand the real importance of of, of that help, because you you you're not here to to see it. Experience. You're not here to experience it. Um, yeah, I mean I I'm here because I believe I have a contribution to make to. You know, my country. I was born here, regardless of whether people think I'm a foreigner or not. <laughs> I was born here. Um, you know, and and and, and, I, and I I'm really trying to drag them into the 21st century in terms of in terms of sport and thinking about sport and sport related um, things. 
Well, don't, you don't have to ask this question if you don't want to because you kind of touched on it. It's more of, a, of me not taking up your time, but why do you think people stay away from 20, 30 years? And I'm not saying I'm, it's, it's a lot different for me, so I'm not going to say I'm any better than them because that's not what I'm thinking. I want to get that across because for me, uh, even though I was born and raised in England, I, I can't go very long without touching a foot in this place mm. because even though England's where I'm supposed to be more com most comfortable and in general, I probably am, there's certain things I don't have to explain to people when I'm here and I'm just myself, which is sad in a lot of ways. Mm. So um, I can't imagine... But it, it, it is a strange question because, I mean, like my sister who went away with me, Probably she's been back here once in that time. She is, you know, there's a lot. She's probably been here once, if that. Yet, I have, I have, I have a, a sister that was born in England who was about to, she's just, they just built a house, just got a house built here. Because she'd be spending more time here now. And her husband will be retiring. She was born in England, so she has more affiliation now here in Barbados than my sister who was born here. Um, now my own two kids, my daughter, she's probably more Barbadian than me. <laughs> she was born in England. Okay. Uh, yet my son is the opposite. You know, he's more English than... Um, but. I don't know, I, I, I guess a lot of the people who, I mean, all the people who went before <clears throat> used to have this vision of, you know, go and make their living and eventually come back and retire to Barbados. Um, what I would say, Barbados is not an easy place to retire. It's not an easy place to retire. If you're going to just leave where you are, to come back to return after being away for so long. Um, because you are still seeing Barbados as the Barbados you left. Where you could trust people, you could leave your doors open. Those type of things when you left 40, 50 years ago. Now you come back to a, a Barbados now, which is a, a totally different reality. Um, a lot of those people get frustrated, a lot of them get taken advantage of, and a lot of them lose what they've worked for, and eventually they, they, they don't last a year, and they run back to England. And I think that is because they've been away for too long, you know, they haven't kept that you see you back on a regular basis. They haven't kept up that. They've been away 30, 40 years, come back expecting this fine Barbados in the 60s. Um, I, I, and, I, and I think that's one of the problems that then after a while, when they hear the stories, um, you know, I've been away too long, I'm not gonna, I'll go for a holiday, but I won't come back to live. If I mention these two words to you, and I'm not mentioning it as a cricketer, I'm not talking about the cricket, I'm talking about the current situation, Collis King. What comes to your mind about that current situation? It is unfortunate, um, but at the same time, I, I, I think, I think Collis, and I spoke to Collis the other day, you know, I think he, you know, he has to take part of the, part of the blame because Collis has been back and forth to England for 44 years, right? Um, on each occasion, obviously, he's never had any problems. No. It's not personally. No, just the rules, no, the rules. This is clear yeah, the rules. About him. Yeah. This is the whole no, but, but, no but, but the rules that the people have is that, which is for everyone, is that if you are in if you are in England on a visitor's visa, if you are there on a visitor's visa, if you want to apply for spousal visas, 
all spouses' visas have to be applied for in your country. <coughs> you can't apply for it in England. Right. So Collis was there on a visitor's visa, then he applied for a spousal visa while he was in England. So they have said to him, spousal visas have to be applied for not just for you, not just for you, Collis, for everybody in in your country. So hence that's why he said to come back here um, to put in the put in the application. Um, you know, it is it is very unfortunate that it has happened, but you know, you know, Collis, Collis is usually here on a regular basis. Um, I don't know who advised him to play for it there, but while he was here, I mean, he should have played for it here, it, and it would go on in as an application, like any other person's application. Um, but I mean, I'm sure he'll, you know, it will be sorted, um, you know, he, he has no record of doing anything, so he, he will get it sorted, but it will just take time, it's just unfortunate that it's had to be so much in the public glare, and everybody's getting involved and having their say, and just like you know, the windrush thing came up, it was a storm, and it was dealt with. I'm just going to ask you a few quick questions. Um, I think instead of, I think I should gear this one maybe to young people or to parents. If your son or daughter, if a son or daughter, if there a parent came, what would you tell parents who have a son or daughter today in the West Indies, Barbados, or the whole region? who really has a desire to become a sports person, but they're more into academia. The parent is more into academia, but the child has this desire. Not, they're not saying that they want to neglect academia. They really want to become a sports person. Well, listen, the, 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 there are too many examples in this world of sportsmen who are multi, multi-millionaires. So that, that tells you that being a sports person is a viable and a lucrative career. Um, how many doctors can you have? How many lawyers can you have? Everybody can be a lawyer or a doctor. Um, unfortunately, the Caribbean people feel that those are the only professions worth anything, being a lawyer or a doctor. Um, they're ten a penny. If you are a, a very good sports person, you know, you can make an extremely good living for you and your family. Um, the guys now who are playing these T20 leagues, you know, some people, you can get a million US dollars for four weeks work. You know, you could go to what university? You know, where would you earn that? For four weeks to do something that you really enjoy doing. For me, what, what we've been doing here is what it's about. Providing a platform so that the talented sports person can pursue sports and academics at the same time. Um, what I would say to them, academia is fine. You know, if you're not, but academia is not for everybody. Um, you know, if, if your son has the, the talent and passion for a sport because you want him to be a doctor or a lawyer, you know, allow him to, to and support him what he wants to do. And sport is a viable profession and a lucrative one too. The last question I'll ask you is whether it be current or in the future, what do you want to be mostly remembered for? Um, <clears throat> for me right now, really, um, I'm currently I'm currently now about really providing for my grandchildren and, and their future. That, that 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 is my that's what I'm about now. That you know they are provided for. You know when I when when I am no longer around. Um, the rest of the stuff is, you know, I've done what I've had to do. You know, I, I've enjoyed my journey. I've enjoyed my career. Sport has been fantastic for me. Right through, 
still now. I mean, um, it's been my life. Uh, it will continue to be my life. But but right now, I, I really would prefer to be remembered that you know I I made sure that my grandchildren were in in, in looked after well to to have a future. That, that that is really for me right now, the number one priority. I think that's a fantastic <laughs> way of looking at that. Mm -hmm. Not many people would have said that, but mm -hmm. I think that's a very fantastic way of looking at things. Especially when I look at where I am from in London, and I can see people of your generation that obviously they live in a country that's hard to live in, mm -hmm. but you can tell that they've never had that intention of even looking after their own kids for not grandkids, their yeah. own kids. So for you to be still thinking about that at this age is yeah, quite yeah, wonderful. That, that's, that, that's my number one focus. Right now I have two grandchildren. Uh, my daughter, she has two grandchildren, two children. She's on her own. Um, one of those the boy, he's 16 this year, he lives with us, he's been with us since six. Um, and my granddaughter, right now, that's, my son doesn't have any kids yet. So really, those two are my priority, that, that, is, that is number one. Mm -hmm. Oh man, well, <laughs> that's, that's a fantastic way to say it, thank you. No problem. Uh,